Hi and welcome. This is part one of a project where I make a safety drawbar and the safety part is a shear pin. So in this first part we will evaluate the strength of various shear pins to see which one I should use so that if in the event of my leaving a wrench in the mill and on the drawbar and turning it on the pin will shear rather than damage the drivetrain of the mill. So one thing you might not know about me is that I love tools. I really love tools. I have ever since I was in sixth grade and graduated and my dad gave me my first craftsman tool kit and every time I get a new tool I can just imagine all of the things I can do with them that I couldn't do before. Sometimes I like tools just for their own sake. So imagine my dismay when I discovered recently that on my really nice Acra mill I discovered a tool that perhaps I don't need. So I discovered that the motor can double as a wrench holder slash spindle stop. And I found out that, you know, that's possibly not a good idea and not a great tool to have. So I think this project will become the solution that prevents the motor from acting like that sort of tool. And what I imagine is that if this shaft was not actually attached to the part the wrench attaches to, except by a pin, then in the case of knuckle brain leaving the wrench <laughs> in the drawbar uh, again, <laughs> then the pin will shear and the wrench won't do as much damage, nor will you damage the train inside the uh, mill. <laughs> so I think the first step will be to create a fixture where I can test the strength of various size shear pins and various materials. So I think we're going to start there. So before we get started with this project of making the safety drawbar, we need to evaluate the materials we're going to use as the shear pin because we need the drawbar to work under normal tightening circumstances and have that shear pin break only in extreme circumstances. So uh, in order to understand how we could, you know, what material we need to use, first we need to understand what a lever is. And most people are very familiar with a lever. They use them probably more often than they think. Uh, opening up a paint lid with a, a paint can opener or this little crowbar here. Uh, these are all examples of levers. So let's take a look, closer look at this. So if you have a solid piece of material like steel and you have a rotation point, well, let's start in the middle. If we have a rotation point in the middle and so the, the, by middle me means the same distance on both sides of the rotation point or fulcrum say this is five units of length and this also is five units of length then if we put five pounds out here it will balance perfectly with five pounds on the other side but anyone who sat on a seesaw has no noticed that if you move closer to the center on one side that a smaller weight on the other side will compensate for a large weight on the other side so let's take a look at that example So if we have the same piece of wood with a fulcrum on one side with one unit of length on one side and 10 units of length on the other side, I know this adds up to 11, not like 10 like the last time, but it'll make the numbers work out nice. Uh, a weight of one pound at the far end will balance with 10 pounds at this end. So you notice there's some sort of mechanical advantage going on there. And what that is, is torque advantage or torque amplification. And the ratio of these two sides is the force or weight of that object, even though weight and force are not exactly interchangeable, but we're going to use them that way, times the length from the fulcrum 
is equal to the force or weight of the second object times the second length. And you can see this ends up with a ratio, so that if you double one, you have the other. Uh, there is a trade-off for this mechanical advantage that you gain, and that trade-off is that if one side goes down by a large amount, the long end, the other side will only move by a relatively small amount. And you can see that in this case. Here is the neutral case, and here is a slight amount of angle change, say 10 degrees. You'll notice that this side had to move this distance, while this other side only moved a much smaller distance because they're attached. So the side that gets the big mechanical advantage moves a much shorter distance than the side that does not. You need, that, that won't really apply in this project, but it could come into play if you are designing a project with, you know, motion restrictions. So you just need to keep that in the back of your mind that the side that gets the most mechanical advantage moves the smallest amount. And if you need to move through a certain arc, you may have to uh, adjust your design accordingly. All right. At this point, you might be asking yourself why the trip down memory lane to high school physics, because I didn't like it then, I like it less now. Levers actually apply in this situation, because torque and the action of a lever are very, very similar in how they act. So if we have this drawbar here driven by a motor on the main shaft through a bunch of gears and belts, depending on how your mill head is set up, um, that goes up and through a larger piece that has the wrench flats on it that only attaches by the pin that goes through it. Believe it or not, we have a lever arm situation here and we can analyze this problem the same way. So if, for example, that center, center, center shaft was two tenths of an inch in diameter, that would make its radius 0.1 inches large. And if I look at the wrench flat portion of it that goes around the outside, and I attach a wrench to this, the wrench actually becomes a piece or an integral part of this outer rotating surface. So all we need to consider is the distance from the center of rotation, which is the center of that shaft, to the end of the wrench that distance is our other side of the lever. Here's our fulcrum in the middle. And if this was 12 inches, and I choose that for a good reason, because at 12 inches it's a foot, and that means if I put one pound out here, I have a foot pound of torque, which is just convenient since most devices measure either in foot pounds or ounce inches, um, but in, the case, in this case, foot pounds. So. We actually have a lever situation here, and the torque amplification is the ratio of these two lengths. So I have 12.0 inches on one side and 0 0.1 inches on the other side. And you will notice that these units cancel out and leave me with something without units that is just a ratio of the two numbers. 120 times, which means that if I put one pound of force out here, I will be applying to this other side 120 pounds. And by the other side, we mean this interface between the center rotating part and the large outer part that the wrench is attached to. And you will see, maybe you see already, that some of the pin strengths that I found in the machinist handbook, 1,000 pounds, uh, eighth inch uh, hard alloy pin with 1,600 pounds shear strength. Um, if the pin only goes through one side, this is the shear strength for them. Uh, so it, it only breaks at one point. You can see that when I divide 1,000 pounds by 120, all of a sudden, that's less than 10. That means less than 10 pounds out here will break that pin. Now, what we're actually going to be used is uh, something called double shear strength 
which is about double that number. And uh, the reason for that is because our pin is going to go all the way through. So there will be two interface points between the part the wrench attached to and the center spindle. And that will be called double shear, and it's approximately twice the strength. Now, uh, if this part gets damaged because the metal's soft and the pin, um, as you're rotating this, damages one side so that you have a little bit of relief, then what will happen is, is that this won't be perfectly symmetrical and the pin will not feel equal forces on both sides of the pin at the same time and the shear strength will be somewhat less than twice, uh, which would be the ideal. So we need to take that into consideration as well. Um, also, uh, we need to look at pin materials and uh, some of these materials uh, fail differently. So the hard alloy pin fails catastrophically and sort of instantaneously. You reach its yield strength and boom, it pops and the parts pop out. Uh, the brass and the split pin, I mean the split pin you can imagine because its profile looks like this. So it's hollow. So as you're applying force from one side, one side will tend to crush in a little bit and more and more until the metal gets squeezed together and you just have metal down the center and then that metal will rupture and the whole pin will fail. But you can see that's sort of a sequential failure. Same with the brass stock, it's sort of soft and it deforms, uh, softer anyways. This is a hard brass alloy and it will deform slowly and then eventually give out. All right, so now let's see how these numbers can apply to our situation. Um, oh, wait, before we do that, uh, the handbook of uh, Machinist Handbook uh, listed split pin and hard alloy pin strength, shear strength, for a single shear junction. We can sort of estimate the double shear junction. Um, I bought some brass stock, which I thought would be good for McMaster car, and it's rated 25,000 PSI. Well, how do I relate PSI to pounds shear strength? Because they don't have the same units. First, it's important to note that these thousand, this 1,000-pound thousand and 1,600 pound number relates to the strength of the pin at this specific diameter. So it is a very specific number for this specific part. 25,000 PSI is the shear strength for this particular brass stock in general, not taking into account the diameter. So let's figure out how we can do that. So, we're trying to figure out how 25,000 PSI can get converted to shear strength for an eighth inch pin. So the first thing we need to understand is that shear strength applies to cross-sectional area. So if I have an eighth inch pin like this, drawn much larger, the square inches they're talking about are the cross-sectional area, like this for example. And I bet you already know how to calculate that. It's just the area of the circle based on the, the uh, radius of that circle. So the answer is pi r squared is the surface area, uh, the cross-sectional area, which would just be pi times 0 0.125 squared, which equals... 0.0491 inches squared. So we know the cross-sectional area is 0 0.0491 square inches. Uh, we know that the brass stock has a strength in general of 25,000 PSI. So to calculate the shear strength, we just multiply those two numbers together. So we have 25,000 pounds per square inch times 0 0.0491 inches squared. And then you'll notice the units cancel out here for inches, leaving the final units, the only thing left, with pounds. And this is a very, very important thing to do when you're doing unit conversion, is to list all the units when you do your multiplications division, also cancel out like units because 
inches squared divided by inches squared is just one. So we can just get rid of it. And that will leave us. And when you're done, if you've done it right, you will end up with just the units you're interested in. In this case, it'll be 25,000 pounds times 0 0.0491, which works out to approximately 1,228 pounds. So 1,228 pounds for a 1 8 inch shear pin made out of that brass stock. We now have our numbers. So now let's see how this applies to the actual part. All right, so my actual part, the center diameter of the center shaft of the drawbar is 0.375 inches in diameter, which would make the radius 0.1875 inches. And if for simplicity's sake, um, we consider a 12 inch wrench attached to the end of that, in reality it's closer to 8 inches. But uh, if we just overkill it and consider a 12 inch wrench, also so that this number that we're working out to can also be related to foot pounds very easily, um, we have a ratio of 12 divided by 0.18. 75 which equals 64 times which means the torque amplification one pound of force out here equals 64 pounds of force at the interface between where the wrench attaches and that center pin um, if we look at the strength of these materials and consider a double shear situation where the pin goes all the way through which I intend to then for the split pin It will be 1,000 pounds times 2 divided by 64, which will equal approximately 31.25 uh, 31 pounds of force at the edge of that at the end of that wrench. Uh, for the hard alloy pin. It will be 1,600 times 2 divided by 64, which will equal approximately 50 pounds of force. And for the brass stock, it will be 12, uh, let's write it down first. For the brass, it will be 1,228 times 2 divided by 64, which will equal... 38.38 pounds of force. Now in reality, I actually expect this number in practice to be a little bit smaller because I don't expect the shear like I was talking about earlier to happen simultaneously uh, on both sides of the pin. I expect one side to contact first, uh, the force applied there, deformation start to happen, then maybe the other side comes into contact. So one side is going to start to fail first, which means the number will actually be a little bit lower than this. Um, so uh, in choosing the material, we should actually test this and see what in practice we act, what values we actually get for the shear. So let's go do that. Uh, and then we can design the rest of the part. All right. So I didn't want to neglect the metric users out there because uh, there are plenty more of you than there are of us. But uh, uh, so, so in American units, uh, the, the torque is measured in foot pounds and inch ounces. And in the metric system, it's kilogram meters and gram centimeters. Uh, and the formulas work as long as you stay in the same unit system and the same units. So just keep that in mind when you're, when you're applying you know, the formula force times length is equal to force times length. Um, for engineers, they don't consider kilograms, grams, pounds, and inches because that is actually weight. And just for your information, if you care, uh, weight is a rela relationship between mass and the Earth's gravity. First of all, the Earth's gravity is not consistent everywhere on the planet. So the amount of force a specific mass feels based on that gravity will vary depending on where you are. Now it's a very small change, so for what we're doing, that's not really important. 
But what engineers consider, instead of kilogram meters and gram centimeters, is newton meters. And a newton is essentially the mass in kilograms different than the weight. It's actually the amount of matter times the acceleration of gravity or whatever acceleration the object's feeling. And that becomes the newton times meters. So very similar, but just so you know, probably more information than you cared about. Also, there's one other thing I didn't mention, which is that if you have a more complicated problem, we've just been talking about problems where you have a single lever arm with a single force or weight at one end and a single weight at the other end. Believe it or not, this, if you have a more complicated situation, this actually uh, extends very, very easily. Basically, the rule, this rule, is just the sum of torques the sum of forces times lengths from fulcrum of one side is equal to the sum of force times lengths on the other side of the fulcrum. And just note that if, if one, one is pushing down, then you could consider that positive. And if the other one's going up, then you may consider that negative. You need to pick your sign. Just know that, that one will be the opposite of the other and you need to be consistent. But it's basically just a sum of these forces times lengths and they will be equal to each other if this is not in motion and it is in equilibrium. All right, so I think we should get on with the testing and figure out what uh, shear pins to use. All right, so we're starting first with the brass pin. And uh, so this torque gauge measures in foot pounds or uh, uh, kilogram meters. I've got it set for foot pounds right now. And we're starting with the brass shear pin because it's the softest. This is the second time I've done this experiment because the first time I started with the hardened alloy pin and you can see it deformed the hole so all the tests after that were kind of skewed. So we're going to start with the softest and I made a, pin, uh, a separate hole for each pin type so uh, hopefully we'll have a better result this time. So here is the soft brass pin. So applying pressure, 8 foot pounds, 12 foot pounds, 14, 15, 16 starting to flex and it's sheared much sooner than I thought so 17.9 foot-pounds for the brass shear pin okay so here's the uh, the steel split pin 15 16 it's starting to fail 17 18 20 and it's 25 foot-pounds, 25.7. All right, so here we go with our last one. This is the hardened steel pin. And as I recall, this one fails catastrophically. I actually have to step on the foot brake on the lathe for this one. So here we are at 15, 17, 20, 22, 23, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, There it is, 32.1. So all of these results were somewhat lower than the double shear strength, probably close to half. So uh, a couple of problems I think I had in my design for this test piece is there's a little bit more slop in between the shaft and the part that the uh, wrench attaches to than probably should have been. So maybe that's causing it to cant a little bit. I am putting all my torque on one side. Uh, so it's really failing closer to single shear mode, which is important to note when I get over to the mill over there uh, and my final choice of material. All right, so just to show you what I did on the mill is I put a tool in a collet and tightened it to what I consider normal tightness for the mill. And then I put my torque wrench up here and tightened it till just until it just started to move. And uh, that gave me uh, a starting number. Then I tried several more times to make it a little bit tighter than I would ordinarily use just to get some numbers to see how many foot pounds of torque it takes to adequately tighten the collet on the uh, mill. Also, I was using this bar, which is a two foot long bar 
to do the tightening when in fact I normally use this 8 inch modified wrench to do my tightening. So I had a lot more torque, so I'm, I probably was tightening it the entire time more than you normally would. Uh, let's go evaluate these results and see what conclusions we can make. So the results of my measurements are kind of skewed a bit. Uh, they're, they're pretty close to the half shear, uh, the single shear strength of the individual parts. Uh, a lot closer than double shear. And I think that was partly due to the fact that I was not careful when I uh, made this part and uh, on the lathe turned the smaller diameter that goes through the middle because there was too much slop, I think. So uh, I think a closer fit would have made a better result. Also, uh, the cold rolled steel pin when I was doing that, I noticed that it actually broke all the way through. And that reason, uh, the shaft itself, and I think the reason for that is because I uh, cross-drilled multiple points so that I could have a separate pinhole for every type of pin because the first time, as you can see here, it really deformed the hole, the hardened steel pin, which failed around 50 pounds the first time. Uh, so that was actually probably close to double shear the first time, but uh, this time it failed at 32.1 foot-pounds. Uh, but actually it was the shaft failing and I didn't even notice that until I just got here. So when I actually make the drawbar, uh, I'm a bit conflicted because I won't be able to test the drawbar because I'm not willing to leave the wrench in on purpose. Uh, I'm sure that Knuckle Brain will do that all on his own given enough time. Yeah, the pin didn't even break. Uh, so I think what I'll do is I'll start with the brass pin. I will be careful to make the inner shaft diameter a much closer fit to the to the uh, reamed hole in this, and uh, hopefully the brass will be strong enough. But if it's not, I can always uh, upgrade to the uh, hardened steel pin, the alloy pin. And you know the alloy pins fail catastrophically. When I was doing these other tests that uh, I don't, I'm not showing you, um, the these pins failed all of a sudden. All the other pins fail slowly, um, which may be a problem. Maybe I won't use the brass pin because. You know, as you tighten it, you're going to form a tiny bit and a tiny bit and a tiny bit. And then eventually it's going to fail when it shouldn't uh, because you have slowly over time deformed the pin. So it's uh, total failure strength is going to go down over time. So I think I'll probably go with the hardened steel pin. Uh, I think it'll be plenty weak to fail in a catastrophic situation, but plenty strong for normal daily operation. So uh, why don't we go build the part?